Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to San Francisco Public Library. I'm Michelle Jeffers with the library. Before we begin tonight's program, this afternoon's program, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatushalones peoples. We benefit from living and working on their traditional land, and as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and we wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatish community. Again, welcome to the Corette Auditorium today for a book talk with Julia Flynn Seiler and Catherine Ma about Catherine's new book, The Chinese Groove. I'm delighted to welcome them. They're two of my favorites and I've also had the pleasure of working with them for a long time with Lit Quick. Let me give you their brief bios and then they'll join us on stage. Catherine is the author of the widely praised novel, The Year She Left Us, which was named a New York Times Editor's Choice and an NPR Great Read. Her short story collection, which I love, All That Work and Still No Boys, was named a San Francisco Chronicle Notable Book. She is a recipient of the David Meyerson Prize for Fiction and has twice been named a San Francisco Library Laureate. Her new novel, The Chinese Groove, has been praised by such esteemed organizations as the New York Times, Oprah Daily, People Magazine, and the San Francisco Chronicle, among many others, and was chosen as an indie next pick by the American Booksellers Association. As I said, she'll be joined by Julia Flynn Seiler, who is an award-winning author and journalist. Her most recent book was The White Devil's Daughter, The Women Who Fought Slavery in San Francisco's Chinatown. It was a New York Times book review editor's choice and a finalist for the California Book Award. She is also the author of the best-selling nonfiction books, Lost Kingdom, Hawaii's Last Queen, The Sugar Kings, and America's First Imperial Adventure, and The House of Mondavi, The Rise and Fall of an American Wine Dynasty. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage, and please note our booksellers, Folio Books in the back of the room from Noe Valley. They'll be selling books for tonight's event, and I hope you take advantage of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle, so much. It's so much fun to be here with you. We're here on a super great day to be here because if you open up your New York Times this morning, you will see that Catherine's wonderful book, The Chinese Groove, was a New York Times editor's pick. So I'm really happy for you, and it's so well deserved. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so I really love this book, and I can't wait to talk about it with you. Um, it celebrates, it's a book that celebrates Chinese American culture and the joy and resilience of community. And it's funny, it's tender hearted, it's, um, you know, it's got a lot of. It's got a lot of heart, just to repeat myself here a little bit. Um, it's got a, a, a level of sadness to it, too, which is very powerful, and I think that um, makes it uh, especially poignant book. And I think that's why so many places have responded in such a wonderful way to your book, uh, The New York Times, but Indie Next Pick, Amazon Editor's Choice, People Magazine Book book um, Choice. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book, and then we'll launch into a conversation. Uh, the Chinese Groove is a novel. It's a story of a young man from Yunnan, China, nicknamed Shelley, and he comes to San Francisco with very big dreams. And he soon realizes, once he arrives here, that the aunt and uncle, who he will be staying with, aren't exactly who he thought they would be. <laughs> And in fact, had suffered a very terrible personal loss. Um, he finds a yi or a grandfather named Henry, and he discovers a lot about himself along the way. Um, Shelley is his name. That's his nickname, our hero. Uh, he seems to be naive. He's extremely likable. Uh, and I think most striking, he has an irresistible voice. Uh, comic, touching, surprising, sometimes a little more self-aware than we might give him credit for at first. Uh, so I was hoping, Catherine, that you might um, like to read a little bit and we can get a, a taste of Shelley's voice. 
Thank you, Julie. Thank you for those lovely remarks about the book. And again, welcome to everyone. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. And it's especially uh, wonderful to be introduced and in conversation with, with uh, my dear friend, Julie. Um, I'm going to read from the very opening of the book. Uh, so uh, as Julie said, the, the book is narrated by uh, Shelley. He's 18 years old, and he's from southwest China, from Yunnan province, China. Um, so now you need to imagine me as an 18-year-old young man. The relatives treated me rudely, beating me and calling me names. And so on my 18th birthday, my father buried his head in his hands and cried until the bottle was empty and his tears were spent and he was at last decided. It was time to let me go. Grubs, like us, didn't get many chances. And he'd promised mother before she died that he'd send me, their son and only child, away from this unhappy life and into a brighter world. There was an uncle, he said, conveniently rich, living in San Francisco. I should leave our home in Guzhou, Yunnan province, the most beautiful realm in all of China, and move in with uncle and figure out from there foot in the door and student visa and green card and a score of other words my father called out in the weeks that followed as I cleaned our shoes and boiled our broth and swept our single room, words that made no sense to me but ladled not an ounce of care into my black-haired head. I was all for the plan, bathed in mother's dream for me. I'd been waiting for years to depart. I didn't want to be like my friends who were lined up to work at the World Crafts Tin Factory. Theirs wasn't the fate for me. My future lay outside those gates. For where in a factory could I become the man I intended to be, which was a cool guy and a poet? I told my father, yes. The relatives hated me for ancestor reasons, which you might think unfair, but I well understood because I was born into the despised branch of the family. My great-grandfather, a handsome devil, was known to all as the wayward son of his father's third wife, a gambler and an opium addict. The son, not the wife, though who knows, maybe the third wife ate the flower too. In the photo my father has of her, she's really skinny. As far as the aunties were concerned, father and I were lodged on the lowest rung of the family ladder, and nothing we could do would lift us from the mud. From where I stood in proud good Joe, tin capital of China, but lousy with kicking cousins, I couldn't quit soon enough. I'd hold father in a warm embrace and promise to make him proud. Then I'd soar straight to uncle's house, where my new family was waiting. <laughs> I, there, as some of you may know, there were a bunch of poets here just before us. And I, I can't tell you how much I love Shelley's ambition to become a poet in this book. <laughs> which is, <laughs> And he thinks that poets are very well reimbursed in, in, in American life, which is very funny too. He has a, a cousin who's rather dastardly who, who tells him, Oh, poets are, are extremely well paid. And we love our poets, it's true. So tell me, where did the inspiration for Shelley's voice come from? Yeah, it, it, <clears throat> this is one of the great mysteries that we face as writers. Where do the voices come from? Um, I, there are a number of points of origin for the story. Um, and I will say, um, the story, one of the, one, one of the important things to the story is my father's own story. Um, my dad was born in this area of China. He's not from the same hometown as Shelley, but he is from, the, from Yunnan province. And um, I ha was really lucky to be able to go with my parents on a trip that my, they were making. My father was returning to his hometown for the first time in decades. He hadn't been permitted for many years because he grew up pretty close to the border of Vietnam and that area of China was sort of off limits to Westerners even after China had reopened in the 1970s. But here we were in the late 90s, we were taking this trip and I went with my dad and my brother and we met a lot of relatives. By then my father's family had perished, his, his siblings and his parents had all died. 
Um, so it was profoundly sad for my dad in some ways, but also very joyful because he had a lot of nieces and nephews, the children of his siblings, and there were a lot of cousins. And um, I was just trying to keep them all straight. I mean, there were there were many, many relatives, as anyone who has returned to to uh, the family fold, probably people have had similar experiences where you go, you don't really speak the language, and it's a little bewildering, but it's also exciting. And there was an, an older gentleman there of my dad's generation, and um, he was seated at the table of honor with my parents, but no one would talk to him. He was, he was inside the family, but clearly on the outs with the family. And I couldn't get a story from my dad later about who this man was and um, why he was, why he was uh, in disfavor with the family. Uh, my mom told me that he was the son of a concubine wife, but that alone wasn't really the reason I think why he was um, he was he was getting the cold shoulder because that wasn't unusual in those in that generation in those days um, for people to have children by multiple wives. So that gentleman stayed in my mind, and I wanted somehow I thought. This is interesting, and maybe in some ways it's an analogy to being an immigrant, being the child of immigrants. The whole notion, the whole theme of immigration and migration are, you know, it's been a huge part of my life. It's been the defining feature of my life, I'd say. And so I wanted to write about it, but I, I wanted to come at it somewhat differently. And so I thought of this, you know, when I began writing this book, I thought of this gentleman who'd been at the table, but it was invisible to the rest of the family. I thought about how immigrants come to a nation and they might take part in the economy of a, of a new country. They might you know, uh, be, be part of the community, but they're sort of invisible maybe. In some ways, they are not fully visible, shall we say, to the rest of the community. And I thought, I want to try to write about that. How, how can I get into that story? And somehow this idea of the young man came to me. Okay, maybe, um, I mean, one of the things, I'm, I've always been interested in, in immigration, but I have not been interested in just telling my parents' stories. I think we saw early on when uh, more writers of color, more writers from immigrant backgrounds began to be published, they were really, uh, many of them were telling the stories of an earlier part in the 20th century, they're essentially telling their parents' stories. But I wasn't so interested in doing that. I wanted to find a new way in. And so I thought, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll make him a young man. Now, I'll just add one other little story, which, is, which, which was sort of confusing and embarrassing to me, which is <laughs> I had a conversation just like what you and I are doing today, Julie, with my daughter, my daughter, Hannah, who is a writer, um, living in in New York, and I had a book event in New York, and Hannah agreed to be my be my partner in conversation. And one of the first questions she asked me was, "Well, Shelley, I mean, you chose to write about a young man because you were really writing about Grandpa, right? You were writing about your father." And I thought, "Oh, <laughs> was I? I, I? It hadn't really occurred to me." So I think. And the other writers in the audience will know this. Perhaps you have had this experience, Julie. Sometimes the writer is the last to know what we've done. I think that's so true. And it, it, in the light bulb goes off. Questions like Hannah or did I? Was was that the reason? <laughs> yeah. But to, just to take a step back, in a sense, you found a, a wonderful precipitating event. You found the son of a black sheep of a family in China who, because of the nature of his father's situation and his, really had, it, had to make, wanted to make a fresh start. That said, Shelley is extraordinarily positive and hopeful, and um, he is a, 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 a marvelously naive character as he makes his way into America, um, unlike his his dad, who's a bit beaten down in China, and um, so I I thought that that precipitating event was really wonderful, and and part of what I so enjoyed was the way you layered uh, a story on top of that, and that's the story of Peach Blossom Forest or Peach Blossom Land. Could you tell us a little bit about? 
the idea of peach blossom land and how that affected Shelley's decision and his, his experience immigrating. Yes, there's a, there's a legend in China many, many centuries old called the legend of the peach blossom forest. And, uh, you know, I think many cultures, many, many countries um, uh, have, have a similar tale because it's a, it's a story of um, a fisherman who goes out and he stumbles upon a magical land that's a sort of beautiful, harmonious place like we have an, a, the idea of a Shangri-La or a Brigadoon that's time and, and place apart from the real world. And um, Shelley's father is a storyteller in the book. And storytelling is a theme that runs throughout the book um, because I think we fundamentally do relate to one another very much on the level of um, tellers of stories and, and, and audiences of stories. It, and we, and we, we change those roles. Sometimes we're the teller of a story, sometimes we're the receiver of a story. And um, this, this idea of a, of a kind of um, perfect place where you can go and there'll be opportunity and there'll be peace and there'll be harmony really attracts Shelley's father. And he passes that on to his son and says, if you go to San Francisco, you're going to find a better, a better land, a better place. It's very, uh, it's a place of great diversity. Uh, people live together of all different stripes and they, and they live together peacefully and beautifully. And Shelley, Shelley loves this idea. So the peach blossom forest, San Francisco, kind of represents that land for Shelley. Uh, I first heard this tale when I went to see a play a number of years ago in Ashland, Oregon. I love to go to the playhouses, and I, I love to go to Ashland um, for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. They do a lot of plays that are not Shakespeare, and they, they did a play by a Taiwanese uh, playwright, Stan Lai, who wrote this play based on the peach blossom forest legend. And I was fascinated by this legend, and I asked my mom later after I'd seen the play, have you ever heard of this story, The Peach Blossom Forest? And she looked at me like I was nuts. She would, she, it would be like one of my children coming to me at age 50 and saying, have you ever heard of this story, Cinderella? I mean, it, it was so fundamental to my mother's um, education in childhood. Uh, she was so surprised that I never heard of it. So I understood, like, this is something kids in China grow up with. So Shelley would have learn that from an early age. Um, and, um, and, and I wanted to use it as a kind of through line, through line for the tale. But I, I just wanted to add one thing, Julie, because you asked me early on about, in particular, about Shelley's voice. And I will say, you, you alluded to the fact that Shelley has, he has nothing, he has no prospects, he has no, he has no money, he has no job. He's coming to San Francisco. He's um, got some distant American relatives. He's going to impose himself on them. And, you know, he, in his great naivete and boundless optimism, he believes that they're going to give him a job and set him up with housing and give him money, and he's going to be A-OK. -okay. Um, and so his, his optimism infuses his language. He has a really... Uh, it was a great, fun voice to write. He's narrating it with great verve. He does speak English. He studied English for years, and he loves language. He loves wordplay. So a lot of the of the text of the book is Shelley just loving to hear himself talk, which makes for a very fun character to write. Let's make it for a very fun character. So. Peach Blossom Land, set in San Francisco, or more specifically, set in the Outer Sunset. Tell us about the decision to focus so much of the book on the Outer Sunset. Yeah, anybody here from the Outer Sunset neighborhood? I, it, it's a neighborhood that I really, I really love. Um, you know, it's kind of a forgotten quarter of San Francisco, or, or it, it certainly was um, before housing got even tighter and people began to turn to perhaps some of the neighborhoods that are a little less um, desirable or they were less desirable in terms of weather um, and housing stock, you know, in earlier decades. Um, that's where Shelley's uncle and aunt live. And Shelley is shocked when he gets there because he's imagined for, him, for himself that his 
relatives live in some big American palace and he's gonna have his own bedroom and you know, and live it in the lap of luxury. But he gets to the outer sunset and he's surprised, he's surprised by the fog. He's surprised that all the homes are small and modest and, and of uniform style. And um, and I, I, I was, I wanted to set the book there in, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I grew up in houses like that. I didn't grow up in San Francisco, but when I was first born, my parents, who, as I said, had emigrated from China, they lived in Pennsylvania. My dad worked in the steel industry as an engineer, and they lived in Pennsylvania. And um, and I, they brought me home to Levittown, Levittown, Pennsylvania, like Levittown, New York. Um, it was a place that sort of, in some ways, was sort of like the Outer Sunset District. You know, developers had come in in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and built very modest, uniform, then fairly affordable housing. And it gave people uh, a, a, an opportunity to get a foothold in, Ameri in the American economy. And that, that's how my parents, I mean, they were renters at that time. But you know they were beginning to try to make their way in the U.S., and that's what the outer sunset represents to me—a um, a kind of land of opportunity. As modest as it as it, as it seemed to Shelley, it is a sort of land of opportunity. And here in San Francisco, it is a neighborhood where um, a number of of Chinese residents who whose lives or whose families' generations first took root in Chinatown, when they were ready to leave Chinatown, when they had the economic wherewithal and they were ready to, to uh, make that big move, quite a few of them moved to the outer sunset. At first, they weren't allowed there. There were restrictive covenants that kept out people of color, kept out Jews. There, it was written into the deeds of homes that they were not allowed to purchase. But still, eventually, still are written state in law. Deeds some homes. of the deeds still contain that, but it's no longer enforceable because state law changed, federal law changed. Uh, and I wanted to consider and consider what it was to migrate within a city. So we have the transnational immigration. We have Shelley leaving China and coming to a new country. But within San Francisco, we have other parts of his family, his relatives, the aunt and uncle who lived there. Some of that family came originally from Guangzhou province, went to Chinatown, and then made the great migration all the way from you know Stockton Street out to out to the outer sunset, which in some ways is as big a big a change, you know, as crossing the borders of countries. I love the pivoting of the scenes between Chinatown and the sunset, and and uh, Shelley going back and exploring what Chinatown was like a little bit. My last book was uh, 19th century Chinatown. Uh, but the house that I wrote about, Cameron House, is still standing at 920 Sacramento Street. And when there are community gatherings, a lot of the people who are supporting Cameron House are coming from the sunset, the outer sunset. Yeah. So I used Julie's book, Julie's wonderful um, nonfiction book, deeply researched and beautifully reported, called The, the, the White Devil, um, White Devil's Daughters, pardon me, The White Devil's Daughters. And... Um, I, I've studied the history of San Francisco's Chinatown as a kind of um, preparation to begin working on this book and to understand. You know, when you write a novel, you, you come up with a set of characters and you want to really know them well and you create complex backstories for them. It probably never hits the page of the actual novel. There's a lot in my head uh, about who these people are and the, and the family members, but... Um, uh, I, 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 I created pretty complex histories, and I, I studied your, your book and others, other historians about San Francisco's Chinatown. And then we have a wonderful museum here in San Francisco, a wonderful society called the Chinese Historical Society of America. And they did a special exhibit right when I was working on the book called Chinese in the Sunset. It was like a gift, a gift to me, because I went to the exhibit um, and at, at both at Chinese Historical Society's building in Chinatown, but they also uh, had a traveling segment of it 
come to the um, community center in the Outer Sunset. So I went there and I met um, a number of residents of the Outer Sunset and other parts of the Bay Area who had come to visit and I was able to do some oral histories. Oh, and that. that went into the research. And there's a detail in the book where Shelley's um, an earlier generation of relatives have um, set up a little uh, store in the Outer Sunset and at first they're living they're, they're not allowed to buy a home in the sunset. They can't find rental. They can't get a home. And they're just living in the back of the store. That came from one of those oral histories that I did um, visiting that exhibit, Chinese in the Sunset. And now the, the Historical Society is um, gathering information for a new exhibit they're about to do, Chinese in the Richmond. So uh, um, I, I encourage anybody who's interested to take your oral histories to the Chinese Historical Society and, and learn, and, you know, help them learn a little bit more. And cause I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Exhibit. I can't, that, that sounds great. And I love local history. It's so, so wonderful. So tell us the title of your book is the Chinese groove. What is the Chinese groove? Yeah, the Chinese groove is a Shelleyism. I said earlier that Shelley loves to play with language. He's, he, he's, he loves words. He loves messing with words. He has a lot of made-up phrases and, and um, sometimes made-up words, uh, which he takes great delight in. And the Chinese groove is something that he comes up with. Um, and he, he, he has this idea that I am not alone in the world. Like, I, I know I have no prospects. I'm making this big leap of faith. I'm, I'm going to follow this dream of coming to the United States. But there are unspoken bonds between fellow uh, countrymen, he calls them. There are unspoken bonds between other people who have preceded me, who have come from China, and they're going to help me out. They're going to lend a hand. And he calls that the Chinese groove. He thinks that there are connections between people of the same um, background, um, the same country, that are going to be a kind of safety net for him. And he puts a lot of hope into this. And it actually turns out to be kind of troublesome for him because he he makes a lot of mistakes too. He is naive. Not He's not a fool. He's not a fool. And, and that begins to dawn on us as the book goes on. He starts out making so many mistakes that we think, oh, this kid is really going to be in bad trouble. But actually, um, we begin to see that he does have some, shall we just say, street smarts. And the Chinese groove at first, it lets him down. Like he thinks that any Chinaman that he meets, any countryman that he meets, anybody from his home country is going to uh, do right by him. And um, starting with his cousin, starting with his first cousin, whom he puts great faith in, to his uh, to his detriment, shall we say? Um, and we learn that early in the book, not to trust that cousin. Um, but but book sort of plays with this idea. Is there a kind of unspoken connection? You know, do, can we, do we have a sort of vibe with people who are from our, um, uh, our strongest sense of identity? I don't think it's something that is, is unique to, to the Chinese population. I think, um, other groups, whether it's your faith or your ethnicity, or maybe it's your your geography. I mean, how many times have you been to a concert where, you know, you know, the, the performers out there and says, anybody here from Cleveland? And you hear this, you know, this big shout go up from the back of the auditorium. I think people have identities and we, um, and we gather strength from those identities. And sometimes they serve us and sometimes they let us down. I described your book last night over dinner to a friend, and I said, it's a picaresque novel. And I'm wondering if you would agree with that, the idea that this is a, it's almost a coming-of-age tale in which uh, there are a series of memorable rogues that our hero encounters, in a way, and misadventures. And picaresque, of course, comes from the Spanish literature and Don Quixote. Do you think there's elements of the picaresque novel in the Chinese groove, I, there, there, there are, and and that was intentional. Um, and but it started like this. One of the things, because he was coming to San Francisco, one of the things I really wanted to do was to press hard on our 
challenges here in this city and in many cities in the US on the shortage of housing. So because this is a big problem for us, a big challenge for us, and Shelley as a new arrival with no, no job and no, no resources, um, he has to find a place to live. And so one of my early thoughts about the book was I'm going to have Shelley experience a variety of different housing situations. Um, and that's why we see at the beginning of the book, he's moving from situation to situation so that we can kind of get a, just a little glimpse into what the many different options, good options and maybe not so good options are for, for housing in, in San Francisco. So that gave the, that alone gave the book a kind of moving from place to place. And then I thought, oh, this is kind of turning into a picaresque. <laughs> you know, Shelley is Shelley is kind of on the road, if you will. It's not a it's not a long journey across the country, but he is um, he is in motion. He is in motion. And um, one of the uh, books I had in the back of my mind as I began writing the book was um, Vol Voltaire's Candide. I, I did have Candide that, that um, you know, hapless hero um, in, that, in that classic uh, by Voltaire. It, it's, it's um, some would argue that Candide isn't really, isn't really a novel. It's a very fierce satire of, of society. And my book has satirical elements. It's perhaps not quite as mean as, <laughs> yeah, I don't treat Shelley as harshly as Voltaire treated Candide. Has a common be. though, peach blossom forest in the best of all possible worlds, right? Yes, he does, he does say best of all possible worlds in there, but nobody loses half a buttock like they do in Candide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I thought the, uh, I, I don't want to give anything away, so I'll try not to do that, but uh, you did allude to the different um, housing situations that Shelley experienced and that makes it so topical, so much on point for a young man his age and his uh, circumstances. And perhaps the most harrowing part of your book for me was when our hero Shelley lands in Golden Gate Park for a little bit. And I was wondering if you felt that way as writing that and as the mother of children, you know, how, how did you feel about that portion? Cause that really hit me in the gut when he was there. Shelley does, Shelley ends up sleeping in Golden Gate Park. He's, he's unhoused for a while. Um, you know, it was, it was difficult to write that scene, those scenes. I, at first I sort of glossed over them um, and there was a lot of business around the scenes, things happening in the park and all. And then I realized, no, I actually have to go down and, and look at that and really write the, the, um, the bleakness of that, of, of being in that situation. Um, and you, you were talking earlier, Julie, about the sadness in the book. Um, one of the one of the things that's important to me in reading, um, I'm a I'm a big reader, uh, as you might imagine, and in my own fiction and my own writing is to is to also um, contemplate the the sadness and the grief of life. There's no life that's not shadowed by sadness and grief in some way, and so Shelley does. He he runs into trouble. And it's it's somewhat comical, but there's also there are long shadows of family sorrows that are following him in this book. He's lost his mother at an early age. We learn that within the first um, couple of pages at the opening of the book. The relatives that he's visiting in America, um, they have their own sorrow. So uh, the book tries to do the do, do both things, you know, to be funny, to be comical, to bring Shelley into the present day age with a kind of optimism and buoyancy as only a teenager can bring, right? Because teenagers have that natural verb for life. Um, but also to uh, introduce him to sadness and, and difficulty so that he matures and he he, he takes a different kind of journey, a more metaphorical journey, a more emotional journey throughout the course of the book. I, it, it's very, very effective, the, the, the bitter and the sweet together. And just in case you're wondering, 
it really is an uplifting book at the end. <laughs> but there are a few kind of very, very sad points. Now, we are sitting in the marvelous San Francisco Public Library. I love this place. I've spent so much time in the fifth floor uh, San Francisco History Room, which is a treasure of our city. And I know, Catherine, your mother was a librarian, and I just was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of reading and writing in your own life. You touched on being a big reader. Was that because of your mom? Yeah, my mom was a librarian, although my mother's path to becoming a librarian was very convoluted. Um, but uh, she had a huge influence on my on my life, um, and I think it was her love of knowledge, her love of education, and her love of books. Um, my mom had um, f trained first as a scientist because those were the jobs that were really, you know, available to new immigrants to the country, and so she had trained as a chemist, but. Um, then she, she met my dad um, when they were in school here in the US. They both came out of China when they were in their 20s, and they both became scientists. And then they met in, um, in the US. And you know, sometimes people get a very, we talk about romantic, like Shelley is a very romantic thinker. Sometimes people say to me, oh, your parents, you know, they, they, they escaped you know, hardship and war in China. I say, no, they met in Columbus, Ohio. They get, they get very sad when they realize it's just an ordinary American story. Um, but the, my mom, um, after she and my dad married and, and she, um, and they had, they, they started a family, my mom decided to go back to school and become a librarian. And she was a science librarian. And um, she made me come work for her one summer. I, I recently published an essay about this on, uh, uh, in a literary journal, she made me come work for it because she she needed clerical help, and she she um, she just for a, just for a few weeks, and I was kicking around, and you know it was in high school, and she was like, "You're coming to work for me," and it was very illuminating to watch my mom at work. First of all, I mean, you know, it's just so interesting to to uh, we have a take your daughter to work day, but that's like one day, right? I was with my mom for a number of weeks. And it was so interesting to realize, oh, she has a life outside the home. She has a life outside the family. She does important work. There are people who rely on her. And then to see the way she moved about, the, she was working in a science a research and development company, and they had a small library. And just to see the way she moved about the materials, how she handled information, how she knew how to go look for answers, you know, I just, Wow, I, 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 that opened my eyes. I, I didn't myself have a real interest in library science, but I, or information science, as it was called then, began to be, it was beginning to be called it in, that in those times. But um, I had a real respect for it. The main thing my mom gave me was, she took me to the library all the time as a kid, and she never directed what I should read. I mean, when I think about that, look look what we're going through now with so much turmoil around teachers and libraries and what materials they're allowed to have in their classrooms and what can be made available to, to, uh, to uh, children, to minors. It, it's such a contrast to the way my mother approached um, my development as a reader. She never suggested a book to me or um, put any limits on what I read. So if I pulled a book off of my parents' bookshelf, fine. If I, you know, chose a book in the library, I have a searing memory of being in third grade and being in school. You know how you'd go to the library, you'd have library period. And I, we went up, but my third grade class went up to the library for library period. And I chose a book and I brought to have it checked out with the big rubber stamp. And the librarian said to me, no, I think this book is too hard for you. I don't want you to check it out. And I was so shocked because my mom had never questioned anything that I wanted to take out. I mean, I think the librarian was just trying to be careful with me. But I said, I want this book, please. And she said, well, you have to read read from it for me. And she opened the book 
And I read the first paragraph, and I said the word Chicago, and she closed the book, and she said, okay. And she, she, I read the word Chicago. I remember that so clearly. She said, okay, you can take this book home. That's an amazing memory. Thanks it's, for sharing. It's that. so, you know, it's so, wow. it's so important to me because I, I don't know. I'm just I I I, I support um, librarians and teachers in all ways in making materials accessible to children and to all populations. And I'm really proud of the work the American Libraries Association is doing to make sure that materials are available to. Uh, to, to readers of all ages. Amen. I totally agree on that. Uh, so one of your, speaking of a literary character, one of your foils in the Chinese groove is uh, the slick talking Huntington. I particularly like the choice of the name, very San Francisco. Uh, and and it, it, I was reading about Huntington, who liked his nice clothes and was up to all kinds of things. And it really struck me that Huntington could have come straight out of Jane Austen novel. Could have been, could have been perhaps uh, George Wickham. You never know. It, 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 are you an Austenite? You can tell me. It's OK. It's only a few of us here. Does anybody do irony better than Jane Austen? She's so funny. I mean, she, you know, people sometimes, I think, think of her as carving her bits of ivory and just being comedy of ma manner. She actually huge worlds are described in her books. And she takes on um, so many subjects, including economic issues, political issues, you know, way, way beyond just ladies' concerns. And um, I don't, you know, I'm an Austin fan. I, 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 I'm not, a, I'm not, a, 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 I, I don't, you know, my, my, my reading taste doesn't begin and end with Austin. I, there are more modern writers that I think I've, I've been um, influenced by, but it was a lot of fun to write Huntington. There, there's so many San Franciscan politicians who have behaved badly, you know, who've let us down. It was and delicious. A, and when a Chinese American politician um, it, 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 it is a, is a ne'er do well, it really hurts my feelings. I don't know. I I, I think there is a sort of pride that t that takes place, you know, a, a, a sort of swelling of the chest when it was like, oh, one of our community is. Um, you know, become um, someone of influence or power within my community, and then when they, when they, when they let us down, it, 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 yeah, it's a big disappointment. So Huntington was a great, a fun character, a fun character to write. He was delicious to read. Absolutely good fun. Now you had a whole nother career before you became a writer. Could you tell us about your? what you did before and your leap into the writing world. Yes. Um, I didn't know Julia was going to ask me about this. Got to summon the, the steel in my spine to, to own up to the fact that I, I floundered a lot in my, I have floundered a lot in my life trying to find my path. Um, I, uh, uh, um, I, I practiced law. I was a lawyer and practiced law for a number of years. And I, you know, I, I, I was talking about being the child of immigrants and how, how that's shaped my life so much, how, how that's defined me. And um, I, I think the expectations were high on me that I would, um, that I would uh, have a career that was practical, that was stable, that was secure. And um, I did not have the brain or the gifts to follow my parents into the sciences. One summer in my mother's science library convinced me of that. I was like, oh, God, I'm never going to be a chemist. Um, and uh, so I was somebody who read a lot. I was I love words. I like rearranging words into sentences. So I thought, well, I'll be a lawyer. And I practiced law for quite a few years. And I, I really enjoyed it. But um, there were a few times during that career as a lawyer when I found myself starting to write fiction. There was one day, I remember I was sitting in the library, again the library, I always gravitate to the libraries wherever I am, sitting in the law library, and I was supposed to be writing a brief that was due in a couple of days, and instead I wrote a short story, and I Naughty submitted lawyer. it. Yeah, I was, yeah, and I submitted it to a contest just on a lark, and it won a prize. 
took me like another 10 years to work up the courage to leave my law practice and start to become a writer. But um, it was just enough of a little signal like, okay, maybe maybe you could do this. And it took, it, it took me way too long, really, to, to, um, to uh, try to imagine something different for myself. But I'm, I'm so happy that I did. I've had the support of my family, and that's been, that's been wonderful. And um, I'm so happy to bring this book out because, gosh, I've just, now it's been out for about two months, and I've heard from a lot of readers now. I mean, in the beginning, you're, you know, you're waiting breathlessly to see what the critics say. But now I'm starting to hear from the most important people, which are the readers. And people are telling me how, how much they enjoyed it and what pleasure it's given them to read it. And I thought, I never felt this way as a lawyer. <laughs> like I could, I could help people and, and clients sort of one at a time. But to actually put something out in the world that seems to be really reaching a, a wider, a wider community, that's a wow, that's really something. I mean, I'm proud of my earlier books, but there's something about this book which is um, I think maybe we who knew when I was writing it, it took me years to write. Who knew we'd be in a in in a period of time when we'd really reach for maybe something with a little bit more of an optimistic hero. But people seem to be responding to that, and I'm very grateful for that. An optimistic hero, but I'd also argue your book is touching people because you explore themes of how to repair a broken family and how to build a, a, a new family. And that, I think that's something that every single person can identify with and can feel. We all have, you know, being part of a family is not easy all the time. We all know that. And you handle that so delicately in, in such a nuanced way. Um, and I'm, I'm also so struck by how much of a California book this is. It's um, multicultural California, including a Jewish-Chinese couple uh, and a wonderful jaunt to what's essentially a kibbutz in Southern California. And, you know, I wonder, did it ref does it reflect your life and your experience of living in San Francisco? I mean, San Francisco, it, 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 it has such wonderful diversity, and it's something that I'm so proud of, and it's a reason why I love San Francisco. The book is, in many ways, a love letter to California and to San Francisco, but it makes fun of San Francisco on that score, too, because... We, we Sometimes we like to think of ourselves perhaps as a peach blossom land. Oh, we're so progressive and we're so accepting of, of difference and change. But it's messy. It's messy to be in a, in a very diverse society. It's important to try for it. It's important to work for it. But it's not as easy as it might seem on the surface. And Shelley's very baffled by it. He gets here and he's like, wow, all these mixed racial couples and... He, he's meeting a lesbian couple. He's meeting uh, uh, people from all different walks of life. He, it's not something he's encountered before. And he's expected that everything will be harmonious. And he's finding out that this family is very fractured. And he has to find a way to um, navigate. So yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to really bring the lens onto that aspect of, of, of Bay Area life that is very diverse and very um, uh, and 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 very uh, both both proud of it, proud of our diversity, the way in which we're proud of our diversity, but also we have to recognize that we have our own struggles with it, and we need to keep working on it. And the key to that is communicating with each other, and how hard it is to communicate with each other. And that's why storytelling is a theme of the book because, I find that if we can tell stories to one another, if we can listen to one another's stories, maybe that is the best way, after all, to communicate. Sometimes just straight ahead trying to tell each other what's in our hearts or you know, what we're feeling doesn't really work, especially in families, right? It's always seemed, talk about irony, it's always seemed very ironic to me that the people whom we love the most and the people who love us the most, maybe those are the people that we have the hardest time communicating with. So true. I read it as a love letter to San Francisco and California, and it really struck home. It seemed like a lot of the families I know, 
And I think uh, other people must be reading it that way as, as well. Now, a couple, we're running out of time, and I want to leave enough time for questions. But oh, I've got all these. I just want to touch on one other aspect, which is this amazing cover, which is um, captures the energy, captures Shelley's you know walk through life. And what's the backstory of this cover? I loved it. Yeah, I love the cover. I love the cover. Well, covers are tricky. And and first of all, covers decided by the publisher. They might ask an author for input, but generally speaking, the publisher has final say. So that always makes you know you always start like this, like ah, what are the, what's going to go on the cover? And they but they did ask me. I've this. I've had a wonderful experience working with Counterpoint Press and my editor there, Dan Lopez, and they, they, they did ask, what, what ideas do you have for the cover? And I said, just please, no teacups, no fans, <laughs> no headless women in Mandarin collar dresses. I just, we've kind of moved beyond that, right? We've kind of moved beyond that. And they sent me quite a few options, and this one was just extraordinary. And one of the things that I loved and my agent loved is that the figure who's bounding up the stairs is airborne. And we said, that's our Shelley, he's airborne. And after we had given our input and I told them how much I love this cover, um, then they, then they uh, shared with me the fact that the cover is done by this extraordinary cover cover artist, um, uh, book designer and, and um, artist whose name is Na Kim, and she has designed the covers for many books that you all would know, including um, the wonderful memoir, um, Crying in H Mart. You know, it's, and that, so she, you can see that now, now that you know that, once they told me that I could see that, because uh, her, her style sometimes is very bold, it's very modern, it's very graphic. She doesn't, um, She's just surprising. Well, in, 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 a, in a different language, it captures the energy of your book beautifully. Thank you. And then so I showed my kids, um, and, and their only comment was, Mom, your name is really big. <laughs> I don't know what they thought of that. Oh, that's but funny. That's leave it I to your own family to... Uh, <laughs> a little too big, but remind but, you of something like that. Yeah, Thank right. you. Your family, yeah, you, you have kids. They they uh, they do a good job. They do a good job bringing bringing you back, bringing down you to down earth. to earth. But Shelley is <laughs> Shelley is airborne, and that's my favorite part of the cover. That's just so great. So let's turn it to questions. Do we have any questions for Catherine? I really enjoyed the book, by the way. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm wondering if you, without, I don't want to give anything away, but did you consider uh, an alternative ending? Did you, how did, did you struggle with the ending at all? Did I consider an alternative oh, ending? Oh, did you think of other, other ways to end the novel? That's first one question. Yeah. The other question is you mentioned you're influenced by m more modern authors. I'd love to hear what some of them are, some, some they might be. Excellent follow-up question. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first part. Um, uh, first, the the um, the ending was a surprise to me. Certainly, yeah. I don't outline. I don't outline my books. I do have a sense of what kind of feeling I want to leave the reader with. I mean, when I'm working on a book, I just I am that writer who is the cave explorer, right? I. I can only see a few feet in front of me. I don't. I don't outline a book all the way to the end. I just. I just build it scene by scene, and maybe two thirds of the way through the book, I. I realized what the ending was going to be, and I was surprised. But I didn't quite. I didn't really waver from it. Um, from the from the final action of the book, but as I wrote the final chapter, I was still surprising myself. There were still a few little things that little plosions of action that happen in the final chapter that surprised me. So, I mean, that's the delight of writing. Like, if you leave yourself open to serendipity, um, you know, you can keep yourself entertained all the way through to the last word. So that was, that was a surprise to me. I love beginnings. I love writing endings. If you've done your job as a writer, the ending seems to gather, to gather, gather itself up. And, and deliver itself to you. Middles are darn hard. 
I think middles are the hard part because you're really trying to keep the pace. You want to keep up a reader's interest. You really need to go deep down into the characters and find out who they are and what kind of choices they're going to make. So, yeah, the ending was 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 pretty clear to me all, most of the way through the book. I, I didn't know what it would be, but when it came, I, I, I felt it. That's it. Modern writers who... Um, who have inspired me. I, 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 I really love reading um, the British women writers who are um, funny, kind of funny and, and, and complicated family stories, you know, and, and the Canadian writers, Margaret Atwood, Margaret Drabble, Shirley Hazard, I love, she's Australian-American. But she, she's, um, her books are so, her there, I love the people whose language is really precise. I mean, I, I admire a, a big, bold novel that has kind of um, uh, unusual language or really colorful language, but I think my taste, my, my excitement is mostly to people who can really wield that pen like a, like a weapon. Jane Knight. <laughs> Referring to Jane Austen. <laughs> okay, she's not modern. Any other questions? Oh, I see one. I have yet to read your book, but does Shelley have a Chinese name? He does. He does. And, and do and you have, you already have it in the book? Yeah, it's in okay. the book. It's so in the book. So let me. And he. Um, so he. Shelley is. Uh, it has a. His mother. Before she died, when he was very young, his mother really wanted him to learn English because she thought English is going to be his ticket to a to a you know success in the world. And she um, made his father promise that he would become a, a fluent in English. And his father finds him a teacher when he's um, in high school, who happens to be a woman who's British, and she loves poetry. And her favorite poet is the poet Shelley. So she gives her um, student this name, Shelley. And uh, um, those of you who speak Chinese know that um, oftentimes a Western name is, is, is given that sort of phonetically similar to a Chinese name. Um, so you, 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 know, you might have a Chinese name of multiple characters, but then someone will choose a Western name for you or you'll choose it for yourself that's a little bit similar sounding. So his, his Chinese name is given in the book. And, but when he's in the U.S., he, he does go by this Western nickname. So my second question is about your Chinese name. Parents take a lot of time in um, choosing the Chinese name, and especially the character. And I'm discovering it only in my later life right now. So do you have one, and have you become that Chinese name? I do have a Chinese name. It's very precious to me, um, because my mother gave us each Chinese name. Um, Ma is my last name, and Yi Chen is my Chinese name. Um, it means, uh, well, I used the word precious just now. It means like precious jewels or precious gems. So have I become that name? I suppose I, I was born as a precious thing to my mom, so she gave me that name. I don't know that I've become more, <laughs> more, of, a, more of a treasure to her as I've gotten older. Uh, but um, I was very, very happy that um, my mother... Before she passed, she, she knew all, th all of my children, and she gave each of my children their Chinese names. And um, now the next generation is having their children. My children's generation is having their children, the older set of cousins, and, one of, and my oldest child now have kids, and my mom has passed, so who's to give them their Chinese names? There are some in our family who speak much better Mandarin than, than I do, but you know that matriarchal figure is gone who's fluent who who could as you say it's very important what name you choose it's it just as in western tradition you know it's that name is going to is going to it it may it may have a huge influence over that person's life and 
So we were a little stumped for a number of years about what are we going to do with this new generation because the matriarch is gone. But as it turned out, my younger brother, he decided, um, he speaks fluent Mandarin. He studied it very diligently all through high school, college, and graduate school. And he decided, he and his wife decided they wanted to move to China and raise their children there. So they moved um, and they lived for quite a few years in Shanghai and Pudong, and their children are like basically native speakers. So they have now taken on the sacred duty of giving Chinese names to the next generation, and they've come up with beautiful names. And that's, and I love that, that it, it's passed over. It, it skipped over my, you know, the job of assigning Chinese names skipped over my, the boomer generation because we're sort of dolts, but the younger generation has picked up the, has picked up the job with great grace. Thank you for asking that. Well, I think that's it. And I would like to say that I think both you and your book are precious gems. <laughs> I couldn't Thank resist you. that. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. And again, Folio Books is in the back of the room, and um, the authors will both be signing their books. Thank you.